So uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm uh, really appreciative to be invited to share some information about the 1960s with you. Uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that there are many, many photographs in this that came from a number of different sources here. And uh, without places where you can go and obtain images, it's hard to do a program like this. So Florida really attracted people because of the natural beauty here. And that was always the case from the very beginning all the way up through the 1960s. And yet the 1960s was really a time of change. The cusp of this turn of the decade uh, was a tremendous change for Sarasota because it was really taken us from the post-World War II era that had lingered and uh, taken us into a very modern, modern era. And uh, Sarasota didn't get here overnight. Uh, we were founded in the 1880s, but I thought you might uh, find it interesting to know that in 1910, we had just a little over 800 people living here. Uh, by 1930, with the boom kind of gone bust, we had uh, 8,000 people living here. By 1950, 18,000 people. By 1960, 33,000 people living here in the city of Sarasota and 76,000 in the county. And within 10 years, uh, the population would be 40,000 people in the city, um, an increase of 700 people per year each year during that decade. Um, as I said in the little uh, piece that uh, opens up the little insert that was in the Sarasota magazine, um, this was a time of change in form. Uh, everything from the automobile styling to fashion to design. Um, and so in 1960, the wings that had been getting bigger and bigger and bigger, kind of culminating in the 1959 Cadillac, all of a sudden were flat and everything around us was changing. It had been 15 years since the close of World War II. We'd been into Vietnam for five years, but it wasn't really on the news yet. Um, and realistically, most of the city's icons were still the pre-World War II stuff. Uh, the seahorses off of uh, Ralph Twitchell's Lido Beach Casino. Um, the skyline of skyscrapers that had been built in the 1920s. Um, the sailboats from the sailing squadron regatta that started back in the 1930s. And, and again, just the natural beauty of the egret, the pelicans, the, the palm tree, in this case a coconut palm, what everybody associates with tropical paradise. It was a big time of change. Downtown would change. The physical infrastructure would change. And in this particular case, you're looking down Lower Main Street with historical uh, storefronts and business blocks on both sides down to the old Hover Arcade that was built in 1912 and that would soon be gone. And you'll notice there is no Marina Jack, there is no Island Park, the bay is the shore of Gulfstream Avenue, very, very different than it is today. And there's no island in the middle of the bay there uh, blocking your view to Lido because Bird Key at that time was just a few little mangroves with one house on it. So the view from the, from the orange blossom, looking out again, you see uh, the old Hover Arcade, the docks at the foot of Main Street. You see this must have been one of the sailing squadron days, right? A hundred sailboats in the bay and, and a beautiful view right out through Big Pass separating Siesta from Lido Key. And the waterfront would change dramatically in the 1950s. And here you have the waterfront with Gulfstream Avenue and a little bit of park and a little bit of seawall and you can see where the Hover Arcade building is. Um, right here, and when we go a couple of more years later, the State Road Department decided that they wanted all the tourists to be able to drive by and see the bay, and so they created this bayfront highway, which indeed separated everybody else from the water. And here we are, we're still trying to reconnect ourselves to the bayfront that is so much a part of lifestyle in Sarasota. Lower Main Street would change dramatically. Uh, you see the, the, block, the business buildings on your right-hand side, everything from Sears Roebuck to Sarasota's first bank and drugstore. Within a couple of years, it would all be demolished and turned into just a parking lot. And they came all the, oh, so here we go, it's all gone. And uh, so just, and then later, uh, it was a parking lot. That's what we do mostly with historic buildings in Sarasota. We, we put parking lots there. 1959, the circus pulled out of the winter quarters out east of town off of Beneva Road. And while they did move to Venice, this was the last time that train pulled out of the station at Sarasota. And without those winter quarters out there, which were just abandoned at that point, um, Sarasota reverted back to what had attracted people here at the beginning, which was basically the beaches and the weather and nature 
And so in the 1960s, all the promo was about the beaches. This is a great little magazine called Panorama of Sarasota that has wonderful aerial images in it that you'll see in a moment. And, uh, you know, the beaches were uh, hotels all the way down Lido, where mostly you have condos now. This was how people got introduced to Sarasota. They'd come for a weekend or come for a week. Then they'd get an apartment and stay for six months. Then they'd buy a home and stay here forever. And that's how that population grew. This is the Lido Beach Casino, built in 1939, kind of an Art Deco style with those seahorses on it, so iconic of Sarasota. And this is actually, most of the photographs that you find of it are from the, the 40s, but this is actually one from the 1960s, showing folks having a lot of fun out there at the beach. But that was only the case if your skin was light colored like this. If your skin was a darker tone, you weren't welcome at the beach. And so throughout the 1950s, the residents of Sarasota's African-American community tried to stand up for their own rights and go out and actually utilize the beach, which resulted in complaints, um, uh, police blockades, and ultimately in the mid-60s, believe it or not, a absolute prohibition of African-Americans on any local beaches. So this was Jim Crow, south of the south, so to speak. But still, um, this photograph shows a teacher at Booker School who has no... Uh, students in the classroom on this day. And the reason why she has no students is because the school system had closed, was moving to close the Booker schools, and when they said they were going to close the Amaryllis Park School and bus all the African American children out to the white schools, the students themselves decided to protest. And so over 2,300 students said, we're not going to school. But what they really said was, we're not going to the public school because students at New College and some of the other older students at Booker, they organized what was called the Freedom Schools. And here's the little poster that they put up, the clicker, the poster that they put up in, encouraging everybody to boy, boycott the schools. This was Amaryllis Park School that they were talking about closing, and to the left is a, a tree, a slash pine tree with the scars of the turpentine trade, which is what brought a lot of these African American families to Sarasota in the first place. But here's one of the Freedom School classes. They did their own teaching. This lasted for five days. And finally, the school board at the end agreed to keep the Amaryllis Park School open and also ultimately to create magnet schools with Booker High and Bay Haven. Sarasota Memorial Hospital was a really nice modern hospital if you were light-skinned. And if you were dark-skinned, you were not welcome there either. And it wouldn't be until 1966 when the health department allowed African Americans to come and use their services as well. Sarasota would also change from an environmental standpoint. The very nature of what brought everybody here in the first place, the health and vitality of the bay, the fishing, the beauty of it, and everything else was impacted by uh, the development of Bird Key. Because if you look at the dotted lines surrounding this area, you'll notice that it was the huge portion, the majority portion of the grass flats in Sarasota that sustained all the sea life and began the food chain. And yet in 1959, the Arvita Corporation developed it as Bird Key and they made it much larger, and they basically just went and built a seawall out in the middle of the bay and filled it all in with material and developed a very innovative subdivision. In fact, it was the first subdivision in Florida with all the utilities underground, bathing in salt water, I suppose. <laughs> um, this is one of the aerial photographs that appeared in the Panorama magazine taken by Lionel Murphy, an uh, aerial photographer, and uh, he, uh, we're really grateful to him for capturing Sarasota in the 1960s in that way. One of the homes on Bird Key, a great place to live. You're on a tropical island surrounded by the bay, but not too good for the health of the bay itself. This resulted in the uh, creation of a group called Save Our Bays, which brought all sorts of boats out into the bay, blocked traffic out on the waterway, and ended up with the acquisition of South Lido Key as a way to preserve yet another area filled with sea grasses. This also resulted in the very first bulkhead line established in the state of Florida by the Sarasota County Commissioners with the approval of the legislature that said that you could no longer just go out into the bay and put in a seawall and fill it in and claim it to be yours because that's the way it was before 1959. It would be many, many years before any other county in Florida would follow Sarasota's lead. Little, little map of uh, all the things to do in Sarasota kind of reminds me of the film we just saw, big heavy emphasis on the artists. By the way, this is the Sarasota Art Association here on the right, the building where we have a wonderful exhibit as part of Mod Weekend. And then uh, the two buildings that were in uh, the Sarasota Art Association in its original form down below and the original home of the Florida West Coast Symphony, although actually the original home of the Florida West Coast Symphony was in David Cohen's house out on uh, Siesta Key, I believe designed by Paul Rudolph, and I'm sorry if I'm wrong about that. 
Um, a number of architects, Sarasota had a lot of assets coming into the 1960s, so we see some of the famous architects, some of the Sarasota school architects, and some architects we've never heard of before. But there they are in the directory, and you can see that Sarasota had uh, a real great uh, bench strength in terms of architecture, and of course that's one of the things that would very much characterize us in the 1960s. Um, by 1959, by the, by the beginning of the 1960s, we had the wonderful Riverview High, and in this case, the Sarasota High School building by Paul Rudolph, which is just an amazing structure that uh, I think I'll have a chance to say a few words about later. This is the way I remember it, the way it looked when I grew up, and I loved how they left the pine trees and how this whole school was perched on this huge bluff there going down to the tributary to Hudson Bayou. And then directly adjacent, Galloway Furniture, again, 1959, uh, exceptionally creative, based on nature, the form of a morning glory, Victor Lundy, and uh, thanks to uh, 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 Christopher, uh, yesterday I obtained some interesting photographs that I added to the presentation showing the redwood laminated beams that were used to form this shape. These were the largest laminated beams that had been made at that point in time. And of course, very characteristic of Victor Lundy's work. The easiest way to travel on earth was trailways, and that was the bus that I took from Fort Myers to Sarasota before I moved here, and then afterwards to get back to see my grandma and my aunt, who stayed at Fort Myers Beach. But uh, if you wanted to go other places, Sarasota was a part of that too. Uh, electromechanical research out on Fruitville Road was basically the epicenter for the technology that was used to communicate with Mercury, Gemini, and Saturn uh, rocket programs. In other words, they actually invented the technology here in Sarasota that allowed us to get man to the moon and back again. And so this is the Gemini shot. I love this image because it shows two capsules up there, which never happened, I don't believe, at the same time. <laughs> and then the other great thing about it, because of course they're based in Florida, they're showing the globe with Florida right there. So, uh, you know, talk about an advertisement for Sarasota. And so, you know, Lundy's taken this the same way to higher heights as we enter the 1960s. That's St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Happy New Year of uh, January 1st, 1960, says the world's ills lesson, peace hopes high. I can't think of a better way to start a year uh, than by that, and then a conversation about whether we were going to lose our sheriff to the Florida Highway Patrol, and then the WKXY over here wishing a happy and radioactive New Year <laughs> for everybody. So um, that's a little scary, but that's kind of that's the scary world I grew up in. And, uh, but gosh, just like the, the video said, why, why in the world live anywhere else? And, and so there was a big case made that Sarasota is sure of its destiny, a new horizon in better living, and on and on as to why Sarasota is the place to be. Florida was booming too. Of course, after uh, World War II, all the ladies and gentlemen that served at the various Army Air Corps bases throughout Florida decided that they wanted to come back and live here and stay here and enjoy the paradise that they had discovered. And I love these maps, like the one on the right, which basically shows how Highway 301 was built for the sole purpose of bringing you directly to Sarasota. <laughs> and of course, the beach always as an attractor. And what I love about this sequence of these images where I plop the visitor's guide, which is the promotional piece, down with the photograph showing that you really can sit in a chair on the beach and just do nothing. And lots of little hotels. These were all the Ma and Pa's all along the shoreline of Florida, little campgrounds and stuff. By the way, on the Gulf Coast, we're down to three campgrounds. Um, the Sun Tide, all these are just evocative of that 60s era where you came down and you didn't have to go in a lobby of a building and go up many stories and find that you don't even have a balcony and you can't even smell the salt air coming off the Gulf. I mean, you just opened up your jealousy glass door that really wasn't keeping the air out anyway. <laughs> and uh, you were good to go. The only thing you had to watch out for in these hotels is the heating system was one of these little bathroom wall heaters. That was supposed to heat the whole thing, but you, you, you weren't here you know, for, uh, for, for that. Anyway, Gulf Coast Cove, and then, uh, and then we started getting into, this was the Travis uh, Motel right across from uh, where the uh, view is today on 41, and uh, now you started to get chains like the Holiday Inn coming in. And uh, of course, more and more people traveling, so these larger entities, and this is a little paired uh, promotional between Gulf Gas and Holiday Inn. I don't know what kind of deal they had, but obviously with the gas station right next door with your big old car that got about eight miles to the gallon, you probably needed some of that Gulf Gas. 
And, uh, and then uh, as to fashion, you know, this was uh, 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 not only a change in the decade, but, you know, Florida is all about relaxation. So you've got resort wear for ladies and gentlemen and good cheer and good taste from Mark IV and Strike. And then you got Harmons for the fancier dudes with the clothes for men who care. Thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and then you got Hayden's on Palm Avenue, moderately priced dresses and accessories. And then you got Webb's of Sarasota. And uh, we've actually, Webb's is in a little um, um, Sarasota School of Architecture building on Palm Avenue that uh, one of the tours is going to take a look at later today. And here's the little view where it's just all glass, folks, so you have no trouble seeing the clothes that you must buy. And you're just walking by or driving by and you see a nice jacket and you just go on in there and get that. And that's exactly what they wanted you to do. Um, I like this one, distinctive men's fashions, totally spectrum in style, out on St. Armand's and then Taffy's. Uh, which I'm also on St. Armand's, and uh, beautiful, uh, very casual, you know, come on in, uh, be measured up, be tailored, and get your nice fit and jacket, and look at all the styles, folks. You know, you walk into a place, and I'm not going to name names, but they're all gray, black, and blue, you know? Well, that's not the 60s, so this is pretty cool to see what's going on, and then uh, reason, reason are shoes, and then look at the little tables that they're displaying the shoes on. They're like boomerang-shaped little tables. They're just awesome. And again, all the glass, and then just welcoming you in. Look at the starburst clock right there to greet you. Um, everything about this is just so evocative of the 1960s. And of course, the fashion. And this isn't, these aren't just fashion shots that I pulled off of Google. This is Sarasota stuff. This, these are photographs taken in Sarasota. Um, and uh, you got to love it. Um, the skirts are getting a little shorter, as you can see. Um, this one, what do you think of this? This is like the Jet Set era, and I thought I'd better show you a close-up of this outfit because it's almost hard to believe, but, um, but there it is. And like I say, this isn't just off of Google, folks. This is right here in our town. And then uh, the exceptionally skimpy bikinis. I can't believe they were wearing this stuff back then. And then, you know, in the recreational vein out at the polo grounds, wherever they were, because Sarasota didn't have polo grounds. But at any rate, uh, this gal out there with her Kentucky Derby hat, which uh, has actually inspired me. I think I'm going to ask my wife to make herself a hat like that next year. <laughs> in one area, Sarasota was ethnically diverse. The only area that I can find is in our taste for food. And so we had the Golden Buddha up on the North Trail in a restaurant that started out as known as the Mecca and it turned into the Golden Buddha. And then we had the Plaza Restaurant, which was a Spanish restaurant downtown, which is where that Liars Club, all those uh, authors that used to sit there and play Liars Poker and smoke their pipes, as you saw in the video, Borden Deal and McKinley Cantor and all them, they all hung out at the Plaza there. That was over on First Street. It's no longer there, like a lot of stuff. And here's the interior of a little place that I think is fantastic. Look at the mid-century um, chairs and the little tables are little tile mosaic tables. I just love and look at the hairpin legs on everything. Just a, a big, huge, huge change from the styles before that. And we had um, apparently two radio, we had a couple of radio stations. This was my favorite when I was growing up in the 60s. Every Saturday morning, you went down to Cuban's Music at Ringling Shopping Center and got your top 40 list. I can almost see it in my head and tell you what was on the top 40 list in the 1970s, but it was all the hits, all the stars, all the news, day and night, 9.30 on your radio, dial WKXY. But I wanna know how many people in the room, including the organizers of this event, knew that there was a WSAF in Sarasota at 12.20 on the dial, <laughs> a radio station simply to feature the mid-century architecture that was taking place in our community at the time. No joke. And, and here's the entertainment center. Now you do a whole theater room. This is the entertainment center of the day, and this is one hi-fi right here, folks. This is where you actually watch the record go around. That was your entertainment. It wasn't a TV. And these big, big speakers that gave you real sound and oh my gosh, the music that they're listening to these days, it just sounds like noise. <laughs> but uh, for the older set, Guy Lombardo came to town, uh, performed out at the Robarts Arena, and this was a multi-purpose facility, gymnastics, sporting events, wrestling, car shows, Guy Lombardo, everything at the uh, Robarts Sports Arena that actually should be pronounced Roberts because that was the name of the family that donated it. And uh, for baseball, we'd had baseball in Sarasota since the 1916 when the first Sarasota baseball team was formed. New York Giants in the 1920s, Chicago White Sox, 
um, here in the 1960s, and that's Al Lang down there on the lower left-hand corner who was mentioned in the, uh, in the film. And then Sarasota had a lot of what they called the tin can tourists, okay? And the tin can tourists came down in all sorts of homemade and factory trailers, camped out here at the Sarasota Mobile Home Park and had a lot of fun. You see the Payne Park Baseball Stadium in the middle there. So they all had a front row seat. They do some square dancing. Half the people in this trailer park were, were, were retired performers from the circus. When I was growing up, you'd have all the munchkins from the Wizard of Oz walking around and going over to Publix. And I'm like, this is interesting. I'm taller than them and I'm only eight years old. And then Sarasota was still trying to figure out what to do about the bayfront because they'd cut themselves off from the bay and nobody was going down to the bay anymore. And so a variety of different plans were developed. Now we're going to create an island in the bay because we got to get on the other side of the road and create an island. So we dredged and filled up the island and we built the Marina Jack and the Marina Mar uh, there. And uh, that's uh, we're kind of moving on up through the 60s. These are the kind of yachts that they had back in the day. This would be like the ship's boat for one of the yachts I see out at Marina Jack today. But uh, people did like to go boating, and that was true throughout the county. And you'd go out with your family. And of course, back then, it was mostly wooden boats. Fiberglass was kind of a new thing, and a lot of people didn't think too much of it because fish will bite more hooks from a wooden boat than they will a fiberglass <laughs> boat. And of course, recreation in the beach, again, always a big thing. Um, and, uh, but, but here's some of the promotional stuff that, uh, you know, mostly for these tracked housing developments. Uh, and yeah, you're laughing about that one up there. Why stay north feeling half dead when you can be buried in sunny Florida for 49.50? So I mean, if that's not compelling, I don't know what is. Um, you know, it's a pretty good deal. Um, and, you know, it won't be a big ceremony because all your friends are still up north anyway, but, it, it's, but, but beyond the fact that you're going to come here to die, it's a very exciting, carefree way of life. Um, and it's the zest of your life. So here's an ad for Kensington Park, which was way out in the boonies. I mean, it was out in the boonies 20 years after it was built, developed by the Paver family and showing this wonderful, the perfect family of husband and wife and daughter and son. And they got their beach buckets and stuff, but they're living like eight miles from the beach. So they've got their own swimming pool. They got their own shuffleboard. Kensington Park has everything everything and you got the little thing now here are the homes okay not a bad price ranging from eleven thousand nine hundred and fifty to almost twenty thousand dollars get yourself a three bedroom two bath including a landscaped lot sixteen hundred dollars down principal and interest hundred and fifteen dollars a month who's in <laughs> and then uh king and smith started developing southgate forest lakes um, and other areas on the outskirts and kind of rocking everybody's boat because all of a sudden people are living way away from downtown. And not only that, they're building shopping centers and stuff to accommodate them. Here's uh, some of the homes you could buy in uh, Gulfgate. And of course, what these are is these are basically about the simplest little gable end ranch style house that you could do. You put a couple bricks on the front, you make it look colonial. So when the people come down here, they say, oh, that's the kind of house I'm used to living in. And then they realize it's got no basement and no attic and they don't know what to do all their stuff. So these are some of the other Gulfgate homes. And again, most of these homes still look exactly the same today. All you do is you add, you double the price and add an extra zero. And then uh, this one, uh, I thought this one was cool because it's got central heat and air conditioning and it's got a Venetian swimming pool. And I have no idea what that is. Now, when I first saw this image, I thought she was holding the color chart for the Formica for the kitchen cabinets. But instead, it actually appears to be just a delightful, almost Calder-esque mobile thing on the cover of the Ridgewood Estates brochure. And there's a little cookie cutter house over there that you would get in Ridgewood Estates. And here she is with her husband. These Florida homes are lovely. I like the outdoor life. You know, he really looks like an outdoorsman to me. I, I think that his idea of outdoor life, he's going to play golf, and then he's going to get bored and wonder why the hell he moved here. But uh, at any rate, um, but Sarasota was different. So while everybody in Florida had tract homes, Sarasota had some other weird stuff going on. And wow, it doesn't kind of work, and then it works really fast. Um, Healy Guesthouse. 
Um, I'm not going to dwell on these folks. Philip Hiss, you know, architects are great to have wonderful architects, but if you don't have patrons, you don't have great architecture. And Philip Hiss was a patron in many different ways, being associated with the Board of Public Instruction, doing his own developments at Lido Shores, getting involved in New College. Um, again, Paul Rudolph and the wonderful um, structure out there on Big Pass. Totally different than the ranch houses that were being sold for 12,000 bucks, but uh, probably not selling for too much more, just a different design. And uh, uh, this is Jack West's uh, home inspired by his trips to uh, Central America and uh, a home on Little Sarasota Bay that uh, was just what he wanted. So he designed it just the way he wanted it. And this is how you'd get to Sarasota with all your stuff. You'd load up all your colonial furniture that's been in your family for years or that you bought when you got married and you put it on that Mayflower truck. It'd take you right down here to Sarasota where you would discover that it doesn't work in your new Florida home. So you'd tell them, just turn that truck around. You don't care what they do with the furniture, but we gotta go shopping, honey, because I'm tired of sitting and eating on the floor. All kind of new modern styles. The idea of bringing music into your home, maybe with a baby grand, uh, and setting things up so you've got great room for socializing, but very much different. And so you'd go to a place like Barkus, now the Sar um, Sarasota uh, Center for Architecture. This building was designed by Joe Farrell, who's with us here today, and his partner and uh, Bill Rupp, and so this is one of those buildings that's all glass, and so if this were a color image, you'd be driving by at night and you'd be seeing all the various beautiful furniture here is what you needed for your Florida home. And if that one didn't catch your eye, maybe this one would. That Galloway's furniture in the shape of a morning glory, completely surrounded by glass, with actually furniture inside designed by the owner of the company, Sarasota's signature store opening up right at the end of 1959, just in time for the 1960s. I grew up eight houses away from this building and got a chance to see it every night, standing on this corner doing this to get the trucks to blow their horn. <laughs> but for those of you that live in Sarasota, I want you to take a close look at this image. What do you see? There are no cars. This is the intersection where 41 and 301 split right in front of the McDonald's and the Sarasota Ford. And I'm seeing three cars. Yesterday there were 300 cars at this intersection. And this is the North Trail with two cars. Man, I'm starting to get nostalgic. This is South Trail right in front of Southgate Mall. That's hopping down there. I see all kind of cars. Ringling Boulevard heading out east of town, freaking out all the downtown merchants because now you could go to Ringling Shopping Center. Just like downtown Main Street, but only half. So you know how they bulldoze all those buildings on that one side of Main Street and they just had the one side left? Well, they basically created the first shopping mall there. They just didn't realize it. Ringling Shopping Center did the same thing. Instead of having something on the other side of the street, they had a big parking lot. Here's the Ringling Shopping Center. S and H Green Stamps, Publix, Cubans Music, Barbershop, Crowder Brothers Hardware, Belk Lindsay, Toy Store, Look at Drugs at the End. I spent every Saturday there. <laughs> Palm Avenue, uh, Miramar, uh, wonderful commercial uh, retail hub for Sarasota with a nice little uh, Sarasota School building on the right-hand side that you can't see in this image, but I wanted to show it to you anyway. You notice these cars are from the 50s, but the photos taken in the 60s, everybody couldn't afford to run out and buy a 60s car. But anyway, any rate, here's Southgate, south of Sarasota, but uh, certainly indicative of the population expansion, the spread of people, urbanization. Here's uh, the bridges that were built were modern bridges. Instead of having a thingy in the middle that turned when, when you honked, or actually the first bridges, they left them open all the time for the boats, and they closed it when the cars wanted to go across. Well, that was all different now. <laughs> now the boats have to wait until the cars go across, and then the boats can go. And, uh, you know, Lido, we've got the landmark hotel out there, big old skyscraper, um, Jack West design. Uh, and we got Frank Folsom Smith's Plymouth Harbor, I think the tallest building in Sarasota when it was built. Uh, as a retirement facility uh, by the Presbyterian Church, and then an aerial view of that out there on Coon Key in Sarasota Bay. Wonderful place to be. And then the terrace out on Siesta, 
um, really kind of modernizing Siesta with a vertical structure there as well. And I remember when that building was built, when they were pouring the foundation for that or they were doing something out there, my dad said he couldn't get concrete because every concrete truck in Florida was heading to that site. So I'm gonna have to talk to Frank about that. But every concrete truck in Florida was heading to that site because they had to do some sort of continuous pour or something and he couldn't get concrete that day and one of his customers was really mad at him. And in um, the DeSoto Terrazzo Corporation, which, you know, that's pretty cool. You got companies that just specialize in Terrazzo. And Shepherd Lumber Company, where you got all the wood. So I thought these things would be kind of cool to see as I kind of wrap up my little things about the 60s. And then Gulfstream Towers, uh, one of the first condos on the bayfront there. Didn't start out as a condo, started out as 60 apartments. Tim Siebert design, kind of cool artist rendering making everything look so smooth and neat and tidy and cool and modern as it was. And the Siesta Beach Pavilion, again, Tim Siebert, um, conceived by or, or, or spurred by a very uh, powerful uh, Parks and Rec advisory board run by a guy named Ray McCarthy, no relation to me. <laughs> and one of my favorites, if not my favorite, um, the Venice Beach um, Pavilion, hyperbolic parabola, the largest one of its type in the world. This architecture was easy. It's just a mathematical equation. And wings on the pavilion, wings on airplanes, Sarasota's modern airport. You know, when Sarasota was founded, everybody came by boat, then they came by train. By the 1960s, they came by car. By the 1970s, they came by plane. Philip Hiss and Ken Thompson, I think that what, he, what Philip Hiss was doing here was convincing Ken Thompson, the city manager, to hire Jack West to design a new city hall building, which he did. Of course, they gave him a million dollar budget, so he designed a glorious building, and then they said, you only got like 600,000 to work with, so you better dumb it down. Jack hated that. He did this one across the street for the uh, Chamber of Commerce. He decided to just to dumb it down first. That way they wouldn't mess with it. By the way, um, Jack's famous quote to me was, um, if life were a baseball game, the score would be architect two. Bureaucracy, seven. <laughs> and uh, the school, that, uh, the Alta Vista School, the Butterfly Wing, uh, glorious, glorious educational thing. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the inner hallway of the Butterfly Wing, uh, very unique structure, all about learning. Jack West's original design for Tuttle, uh, Tuttle Elementary School. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so things are getting space agey again. Here's Jack's design to how to fix the bayfront but it would be easier to get to the moon. And uh, New College, as again was mentioned in the film, uh, really bring in some, tech, uh, some uh, thought to Sarasota. You know, we had graduated to the point where we were ready for a college, and of course a lot of great architecture there that I don't have time to talk about. But I did want to touch again on EMR because this was our connection to what was going on on the planet. And they were taking all these wires and all this stuff and trying to cobble together something that would talk to things in outer space. And all of it was based right here out of Sarasota. All the telemetry, every communication piece for the space program came here. And uh, Sarasota firm handles the space jobs. It's uh, pretty cool stuff, something to be proud of. Basically, they cobbled together a tape recorder and a couple other primitive things, and they made a way to talk to the guys up there and get the, get the rocket to come back down, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and uh, men walks on the moon, and this is pretty much as 60s as it gets. Uh, we had six mayors during the 1960s. I don't know what this says about leadership. We only had one sheriff the whole time. <laughs> By 1970, the Lido Casino would be gone. It was only 30 years old. It was practically a brand new structure, but it must have had termites because it was made out of solid concrete. And while it's being destroyed to Van Wazel, a new icon for Sarasota is coming up. And this would become now what everybody focuses on when they think of Sarasota and not those seahorses out on the beach. But it's still nature inspired because it's a clamshell by Taliesin West and Wesley Peters. And then as we get into the late 60s, we see that we're almost ready for the 70s, folks. I mean, if those aren't some 70s style outfits, I don't know what was. And by uh, December 31st of 1969, uh, apparently uh, Nixon signs a tash slash hints at spending cuts. Um, we've got all sorts of things. We've got a coal pit safety bill that's still trying to be approved by Congress in this session. And then uh, interestingly enough, on the next page, the Christmas presents in the hip world were bags of marijuana. So uh, things were beginning to change a little bit. We'd been into the Vietnam War for 15 years, be another three years before we got the heck out. 
Um, we didn't even know it was coming, but Disney World opening in October of 1971 would pretty much shutter every other small tourist attraction that we had here in Sarasota. So a year and a half out, Disney was there. By 10 years out, we'd have the interstate changing everything. And, uh, but by the end of the 1960s, this is what Sarasota looked like, a town shaped by nature, nature-inspired architects. Architects inspire us, and this is why we're all here today. It's probably not because of the fancy restaurants or the furniture stores or the quality of the homes. It's here because Ver Sarasota is a very, very special place and a place that we all enjoy calling home. Thanks so much.